Hello students, welcome to the analyst dated 19th of September 2023. Today we look at five important articles from the Indian Express and the Hindu. The first article will be regarding the heat waves in Australia. Then we'll look at special session of the parliament. Then we'll take a look at the women reservation bill. And finally, we'll look at two prelim pointers. The first one is gold ETF and then we'll look at the updated UNESCO World Heritage List. Now, the first article that is the heat wave pertains to two aspects that is geography from GS1 as well as disaster management from GS3. Now, Australia is combating a heat wave and more particularly the South Eastern Australia. Now, in this discussion, we'll try to understand what is a heat wave and let's look at the background. So, in last four years, the world has seen three La Nina events. Now, we must understand that La Nina is part of the ENSO cycle. And in ENSO, whenever we have La Nina, it leads to more rain, including the southwest monsoon of India. So, in the last four years, we saw three La Nina events. That tells us what? That means these years had recurrent flooding and excessive rain. But now what has happened? After this three La Nina events, which is also called as a triple dip La Nina. Now, after this, what has happened is that El Nino has come back and El Nino is associated deficit rainfall. Now we must appreciate the 2019-20 Australian bushfire. Therefore, the chances of a heat wave becoming another bush fire or forest fire becomes very high. In this context, the wheat production of Australia will also be hit. And if wheat is affected, and we must appreciate at this point of time that India has imposed restrictions on rice, wheat. Why? Because looking at the issue of inflation in both fuel as well as in food. So the world is staring at a fuel and food inflation while countries are restricting their exports and imposing export duties and the Russia-Ukraine war continues and the oil is again boiling. So this points out that this particular heat wave can again bring another spate of inflation for the world. Now, let's understand how a heat wave can be formed. So, let's appreciate that whenever we have clouds, so what happens? The sun's rays or which is called insulation. So, insulation is blocked. But let's say there are no clouds, then what would happen? More and more sun's rays will be falling directly on the land and therefore more and more losses. What kind of losses? Evapotranspiration losses. So, let's assume a land or let's assume a region where it is cloudless. So what will happen? More evapotranspiration losses. Now if there is more evapotranspiration losses over the period of time what will happen? There will be soil moisture will be low and therefore this will further impede any cloud formation 
Now, simultaneously, let's appreciate that whenever we have a low pressure system at the ground level, then what happens? Winds from all directions, they will come and then they will rise and they will create these clouds. On the other hand, if we have a high pressure system, then what happens? The currents, they will sink and they will distribute from the high pressure cell. So in this condition, we have a cloudless sky. And here you will have clouds. And if these clouds are at all rain bearing, then you will have a lot of rain also. And that is why when we see tropical cyclones, they are low pressure systems and they lead to a lot of rainfall. So depressions, tropical cyclones, all of these are low pressure systems. Now, high pressure system is associated with a lot of stability and cloudlessness. Now, let's assume that there is a land and on top of the land, there is an air mass which is dry and it is hot or warm. So what will happen? Over the period of time, the moisture on the surface, it will evaporate and simultaneously, if there is formation of a high pressure cell, then there will be no circulation for creation of any clouds. And if there are no clouds, then the direct rays of the sun will be incipient on the land and therefore whatever little moisture is left on the surface that will go to evapotranspiration losses. So the favorable conditions for a heat wave is hot dry air over a large space or a region. Then the absence of moisture where? On the land. So lack of any, let's say, lack of any river, lake, pond or moisture. Why? Because if there is moisture or if it is a coastal location, then with the help of moisture, what happens is that your temperature is regulated. It is more moderated. And if you take the example of, let's say, Konkan coast versus Maratwada, then what happens? Konkan coast, the climate is more moderated. Why? Because of presence of water vapor. Why? Because a large water body called the Arabian Sea is nearby. Then the sky should be practically cloudless and this leads to more insulation and therefore more evapotranspiration losses. Then large amplitude of anticyclonic flow. Now we must appreciate that cyclones are associated with low pressure systems and anticyclones naturally will be then a high pressure systems. Now these favorable conditions are given by none other than IMD. Right? So this is also true in any condition wherever we are talking about heat waves or we are talking about any example of climate change for India. Now let's understand in accordance with IMD definitions what is a heat wave. So heat wave is where air temperature becomes dangerous to human body when exposed. And what are the criteria? So for a plain region and why do we have such a differential? Because usually plains are hotter and mountain or hilly regions, they are cooler. So in plains, if the temperature reaches at least 40 degree and in cases of hills, it is 30 degree. Then what should be the departure from normal? So a departure of 4.5 to 6.4 degree will be called a heat wave. And if it exceeds 6.4 degree Celsius, then it is a severe heat wave, right? Now, in India, the period of heat wave is from March to June with the peak month being May. Why? Because this is the time of pre-monsoon. So pre-monsoon, we'll see that the moisture in the air becomes extremely low. Also, this is also the time of dry winds called loo. Simultaneously, we must also appreciate that whenever we look at October, so October heat is multiple times referred, but this heat has a lot of humidity. So whenever you have 
a lot of water vapor in the air. So, such heat waves are not possible. But when we look at the case of May, when we have the maximum amount of heat, more so in the northern plains, then what happens? Then lack of humidity, parallelly you have too much of heat, this can create a heat wave if a high pressure system is created over these lands. Why? Because then this heat will be trapped and it will be very difficult for this heat to escape. And how does this heat escape? Either through addition of some moisture or through coming off, let's say, a cold air mass or some cold winds. So they can dilute this situation or if there are localized thunderstorms. So they can dilute these conditions of heat waves. And therefore, India also goes for a heat index, which is calculated by IMD. And it looks at both air temperature as well as relative humidity. Because it measures how it exactly feels. Then, impact based heat wave warning system, which is color coded, is being taken up by IMD plus NDME. As these heat waves can cause dehydration, they can lead to heat cramps, they can lead to heat exhaustion and they can be extremely fatal to both humans as well as our livestock. And most importantly, a heat wave can damage the standing crop. And the best example is the chances of damage to wheat of Australia, which is directly then associated with food inflation as well as food security. Let's look at the second article and this pertains to your GS2 Indian constitution. Now, a five-day special session of the parliament has begun on September the 18th and it will go till 22nd. Now, what is a special session of the parliament? Now, in the constitution, there is no mention of any special session. The last special session that we saw was in 2017 when the GST was rolled out. But accordance with Article 85, the President will have to summon the House in every six months. That means between two sessions of a parliament, the max gap can be six months. And usually, what do we have? We have three sessions. One is the budget session, then the monsoon session, then the winter session. And the dates and the agenda are more flexible and are to be decided by the parliament itself. Now, budget is the longest. And it usually starts at end of January and goes up till April. Then the monsoon session begins in July and goes till August. Finally, the winter session between November to December. So three sessions. If I call or if the parliament calls, if the president notifies that there will be a special session, so it will be apart from these three sessions. Now, who has the authority to call for this session? So usually the central government will decide. And who is the de facto head of the central government? It is the prime minister who is heading the council of ministers. But the actual decision making powers are with the cabinet. Now for all decisions, we do not go for the entire cabinet meeting. So such decisions are usually taken by the cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs. And this committee will look into all aspects, all issues which relates to the parliament. So small group of the cabinet will decide. And once the decision is taken, then it will be notified by the president. Why? Because all the executive decisions of the government of India is taken in the name 
of the president. Now, historically speaking, there are some precedents that we have gone for special session. So, 1947 on the eve of independence, then in 1962 during Indochina war, then in 1992 to commemorate 50th anniversary of Quit India movement, then in 1997 to commem commemorate 50 years of independence and very recently in 2017 to give India the GST. Now, there is a particular theme to this special session. Given that this special session is also in the backdrop of elections. So the backdrop is women empowerment and themes like and themes and policies of the government of India therefore becomes extremely important for this special session of the parliament. Now the focus of the government has been on women empowerment on gender justice on gender welfareism so whenever we are talking about the women reservation bill that is to go for 33 percent reservation in parliament as well as in state assemblies then the swach bharat abhiyan which created 11 crore toilets and it helped in terms of making india odf free as well as it created these toilets for these households so that women do not have to go to the farms and in open spaces to relieve themselves therefore also providing them with security against gender based violence and gender crimes then ujwala here 9 crore cylinders have already been distributed Then recently 200 rupees of subsidy was announced. Then it will be further rolled out to 75 lakh families. And this pertains to your scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and more deprived families who are still not part of the scheme. Then looking at Jal Jeevan Mission. So 13 crore beneficiary who are households for clean drinking water and tap drinking water. Why? To decrease the drudgery that women go through to find clean drinking water and to also look at issues where children and families are drinking unclean water or polluted water and therefore they are getting diseases. Then, Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao. The idea of decreasing child sex ratio while sensitizing entire India about female foeticide, infanticide, as well as about giving gender justice to not only women but also to children. And to treat all the children equally. Then direct benefit transfer to support motherhood under PM Matru Vandana. Lastly, going for a law to ban instant triple talaq. Post the judgment of the Supreme Court. So all these are various initiatives that the government has taken up and this particular special session will be about the theme of women empowerment and therefore this can become a good means oriented question. The third article pertains to your GS2. Now here granting 33% reservation in the Indian parliament and the state assemblies is the top agenda of the special session. Now we will understand what is the women reservation bill and what is the need. So in accordance with the global gender gap report which comes from World Economic Forum, India stands at 127th rank out of 146 countries. And to improve these rankings and to go for women empowerment, we need to look at the role of women as voters and what is the trend, whether 
the number of voters they are increasing or they are constant or they are decreasing then the presence of them as candidates and therefore our representation so representation in form of mps mlas and in all other fora whether it is judiciary whether it is civil services whether it is educational institutions then this underscores the need to enhance women's participation all across the sectors but most importantly the women reservation bill is about reserving 33% seats in the lok sabha and the state assemblies and what is the current status so approximately 14% of india's parliament and 9% at the state level so when we are talking about mlas and here we are talking about mps so this is dismal considering that women are approximately 50% of the indian population now let's look at some spatial data and it points out to multiple dichotomies so let's look at jammu and kashmir so here the participation is extremely low and here we also see conflict similarly surprisingly the north east again the participation is extremely low and here we are looking at issues of insurgency as well as issues of ethnic conflicts on the other hand it was more of expected that the more literate states they would have better participation for example kerala tamil nadu but it is surprising that some of the most educated states they are also lagging behind when it comes to women participation surprisingly and it is a welcome surprise that the northern plains in terms of women reservation they are at par and at some times above the national average but most importantly and this can become a very good case study that the regions of west bengal jharkhand and chatisgarh they are above the national average now it is pertinent to understand that whenever we are talking about chatisgarh and jharkhand we are essentially also looking at regions of left wing extremism regions of mineral areas tribal regions as well as forested regions and therefore there is some amount of cut off from the cities as well as from the society in general so the lack of infrastructure which we would say is a infrastructure divide at times becomes good reason to sustain cultural practices which are not antithetical to women and which are more which are promoting more participation of women and the best example is chatisgarh now let's look at the issue so here we are going for 33% reservation of seats and the reservation will only be limited to lok sabha it will not be for rajya sabha and there are multiple formats of women reservation bill that we have gone through and first bill was in 1996 then we went also for another bill in 2008 but none were passed then we had two committees also the geeta mukherjee committee and the jayanti natarajan committee then this will be on a rotational basis what do we mean by rotational basis 
so let's say we have four or three seats so this particular seat will be reserved for women for let's say the first year then next year maybe the second seat will be reserved and in third year the last seat will be reserved so the reservation will be on rotational basis so that women candidates get opportunities equal opportunity from all constituencies rather than having a fixed model like so in the cases of scheduled tribe reservation for example we will have the same seat reserved year after year on the other hand here the reservation will be on a rotational basis so this is rotational basis and this is the traditional basis let's say for scheduled tribe and this is for women now this will be valid across the states and uts and the raj sabha and legislative councils are out of this particular scheme now the other issue is whether the reservation will be given within the quota structure that means let's say the scheduled tribe is getting x amount of reservation so 33% of x that means if i have 100 seats for scheduled tribes then 33 will be scheduled tribes who are women and rest will be open open for all that means more women can again participate second issue is that if we are going for quota within quota then in parliament we have reservation for scheduled tribes as well as scheduled caste but we have do we do not have reservation for obcs in terms of parliamentary seats so what will happen to let's say obc women candidates so that is a issue and that is why the parties whose voter base is primarily obcs they are somehow putting some arguments against the bill that means it will be more in consonance if first reservation is applied to all sectors and then part of each sector is reserved for women right now this can only be possible for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe now we must look at the gender wise breakup of voting and over the period of time what we have seen that from approximately 46% we are now coming to around 67% of voting percentage in the last lok sabha that simply means that over the period of time women have been empowered and they are particularly empowered in terms of political representation at least our women they have increased in terms of voting and the next step is representation now one thing that the geeta mukherjee committee and the jayanti natarajan committee they agreed upon is to go for reservation also in raj sabha as well as the legislative councils and it left on the government to decide whether quota will be applicable within quota and what will the government decide in cases of obc castes now let's look at the arguments in favor so the first issue is that indian politics is patriarchal in nature and simultaneously what do we see that there is also family system there is nepotism simultaneously what do we see that there is corruption there is criminalization and there is continuous exclusion of women 
in decision making for example the representation of women in cabinet committees the representation of women in cabinet in council of ministers and that has been all across the political parties however the trend is changing but the trend has only changed very gradually then there is need for affirmative action and this comes from the argument of article 15.3 which calls for special provision for women and children then it is also about political justice and it is also about political representation all of which will help in policy it will help in law it will help in gender justice it will help in gender sensitive executive judiciary as well as the legislature with more representation comes more voices and if there are more voices then debates are more wide versed and if the debates are from all across the aisle then naturally it affirms the ethos of the indian constitution then the women reservation will also ensure that there is strong advocacy for for women related issues and we must also learn from the success of 33% reservation which in many states have gone to 50% reservation when it comes to panchayati raj institutions the pris the fourth article pertains to your gs3 now here the inflows in gold etf is at 16 month high so now we'll understand what is a gold etf and let's take an example let's say i want to invest 5000 rupees and i go to buy a mutual fund so i am going and giving this money to the mutual fund manager and the mutual fund manager gets this 5000 rupees from multiple people from multiple investors so let's say he has a corpus of 1000 crores after collecting the money from all these investors so these 1000 crores this person will invest in multiple companies and on the basis of the return generated maybe my 5000 can become 6000 and let's say it has become 6000 so now i want to retrieve so this mutual fund manager may sell some share and give me back the 6000 rupees after cutting some commission now let's say i want to buy gold so what i'll do i'll give some money in return i will get physical gold from a seller now here what happens the transaction cost is extremely high because someone has to carry this physical gold someone has to store this physical gold and it has to be imported so there is actual movement of gold for me as an in individual who wants to invest in gold so whenever we as investors want to invest in gold we can instead go for etfs exchange traded funds and if i want to buy gold let's say for jewelry here i will need physical gold now how it is different from a mutual fund or from buying a share so let's say you are buying a share so you go and place an order and you get 10 shares on any platform for let's say 10 rupees each so you pay 100 rupees and if the price appreciates you earn a profit if you sell it on the other hand in a etf you are not buying physical gold you are just giving let's say 500 rupees and 
instead of gold you are buying shares so the way shares are visible on the stock market similarly gold etfs are visible on the stock market so you can buy let's say seven shares of a etf you can buy 10 shares of a etf and this exchange traded fund will be linked or indexed to something it can be a sector let's say it can be nifty 50 etf so i do not have the buying capacity to buy all the companies of nifty 50 but i want to invest 5000 rupees in the nifty 50 companies so i buy a single nifty 50 etf for 5000 rupees and maybe i will get 10 shares why because each nifty 50 etf is for 500 rupees so now i want to sell it so i can instantly sell it the moment market opens on the other hand if i were to invest in mutual fund then it will take at least two to five and at times 10 days to buy and then sell so there are layers in this cases whenever you are going for etfs it operates just like shares but this gold etf will be linked to a commodity called physical gold so let's say i don't want to buy physical gold i don't want to keep it in my hand i don't want to keep it in the locker but i have some money which i want to invest in gold why because i'm scared i'm scared that a lot of commodities may not do well a lot of let's say shares or companies may not do well my fds are not giving me returns and there is a russia ukraine crisis and in this case i want to park my money safely in gold so i will buy some shares of gold etf and we must also remember that the government also launched CPSE 22. So 22 shares of central public sector undertaking enterprises and this was given by multiple banks like ICICI 22. So this is essentially an ETF which is linked to the performance of top 22 government companies similarly the gold etf is a good way of earning return from gold without actually buying gold and by keeping it as liquid as shares why because mutual funds are less liquid and if you want to withdraw your money it takes some time now what is the need so need is to diversify your portfolio let's say you want to have a conservative strategy you want to save some money and to gain exposure to various sectors and it hedges against market fluctuations which we are seeing then you are also earning from profit from gold prices changes then it you are seeking exposure to gold without owning it or without storing the physical act asset then taxability is similar to physical gold purchases which includes long term and short term capital gains tax and this has become very popular why because gold etfs has outperformed the market like stock indices like the nifty 50 and the nifty 100 so it is a good bet for conservative investors and it also helps the ordinary indian to participate in stock market as well as to buy gold without india without india being the importer of gold now let's look at the last article for today and this is pertaining to your gs1 art and culture so india now has 42 unesco world heritage sites because there has been two additions in the unesco world heritage sites so india in total has 34 cultural seven natural and one mixed property amongst the world heritage site released by unesco and the two new entrants is firstly shanti niketan and secondly the 13th century hoysala temple now shanti niketan is associated with poet rabindranath tagore and it represents an encounter with 
pan asian modernity focusing on sustainable architecture as well as looking at local traditions and there are some temples in the hoysala temple complex which can be important the first is chenakeshava temple in belur then hoysaleshwara temple in halebidu and keshava temple in somnathpur and there are sculptural panels which narrate stories from hindu epics and puranas now it is very important for all the students that we must look at all the 42 sites and if possible create a two page note for the entire 42 sites as they can be very important prelim pointers right thank you so much i hope it helped